Ella is currently professor of cultural studies at New York University and has since the 1980s written ori on Orientalism and post-colonialism. Her many books include Taboo Memories, Diasporic Voices, Israeli Cinema East-West and the Politics of Representation, Le Sionisme du Point de Vue de ses Victimes Juifs, Talking Visions, and with Robert Stamm, Unthinking Eurocentrism, Flagging Patriotism, Crisis of Narcissism and Anti-Americanism, and a just very recently published Race in Translation, Culture Wars Around the Post-Colonial Atlantic. Ella was recently awarded a Fulbright for her cultural intersections between the Middle East and Latin America. Here for the Memory Marathon, she will present a talk connected to her recent research titled The Arab Jew, Taboo Memories, Diasporic Voices. A very, very warm welcome to Ella Shoat. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I have to confess, this is the first time that I pr participate in such a marathon. I feel like this pressure of speaking very fast. Uh, <laughs> it's a marathon after all, and I hope not to get senile in the middle of it. So I try to write uh, uh, a few things. You know, there is a narrative that says that Israel brought Jews from the diaspora, from the four corners of the globe, ending the Babylonian exile. But could it be that this ingathering of exile was itself a form of engendering new exiles that resulted in a series of traumatic ruptures? What memories could be narrated and which were to be erased to fit official stories of the Jew versus the Arab? Okay. Um, in, in, this is... Uh, two uh, documents, uh, actually, of my parents. This is their laissez passe when they left Iraq in 1950, and this is their Teudat Ole when they arrived in Israel and was registered as Olim, uh, new immigrants. Um, throughout uh, the past three decades, I've written, for those of you who are familiar, about the question that, uh, to describe the question of this dislocation as simply refugees or population exchange or immigrants, uh, would not be sufficient. And I've tried to suggest that the terminology itself is rather uh, complicated. But rather than going through the terminology here, I thought of uh, that in the following uh, emotional cartography of this location, I'll be drawing on a disjointed map for uh, a journey that um, uh, a jointed map for a journey across several places. Uh, a kind of a family odyssey from Iraq to Israel to the US. Dominant cartographies do draw clear boundaries between Israel and the Arab world, as well as between East and West. But we can alternatively re reveal glimpses of the vital possibilities of a dialogical imagination that juxtaposes separate cart uh, geographies and histories, in this case, Iraq, Israel, Palestine, and the US. In interweaving these disparate narratives, I hope to illuminate through associative juxtapositions the making of hyphenated identities, the pain and pleasure of hybridity, of inserting a metaphorical taboo between the Arab and the Jew, uh, actually a metaphorical hyphen between the Arab and the Jew, a kind of a taboo hyphen uh, between two uh, identities, especially in the wake of colonial uh, partition. Was it inevitable that I, an Arab Jew, should end up writing in English about my lived linguistic schism between Hebrew and Arabic? As an Iraqi Jew who grew up in Israel of the 60s, I did not enter the three languages in which I have conducted most of my life with the ease with which privileged children slide into cosmopolitanism. Only a decade has passed since my parents' hasty exodus from Iraq. Ah, oh, wow, a delete. <laughs> well, uh, so just keep them off there. sure. Incredible deletion. Um, 
Um, the word Baghdad did not evoke the fantastic tales of Alibaba, Aladdin, or Sheikh Rezad. Although we could not jump on the next train to Baghdad, it seemed that many of the adults lived longing for a one-way ticket, somehow not exactly to a place, but for a time that shall never return. For us, the younger generation who did not set foot there, Baghdad was the home, the neighborhood, our faces, our family faces, our Iraqi accent, Iraqi dialect, our maqam, music, our food, our grief, our festivities, all shared in the small town of Petah Tikva, or in Hebrew, the Gate of Hope, blithely unaware of how and when this Zionist settlement submerged the Palestinian village of Mlabbes. And yet, that Baghdad was a secretive one, existing on the margins of the Israeli nation, and often, incredible as it may seem, with our own fragile and disoriented participation. The airplanes that were arranged to transport Jews from Iraq to Israel uprooted millennia of life in Babylon, leading into a new diasporic existence. Overnight, we're no longer Iraqis, but Israelis. The Israeli-Arab conflict created a new situation for us. For the first time in our history, we were placed on the horns of a terrible dilemma, having to choose between Arabness and Jewishness. The first associated with the East and Islam, and the second with Europeanness and the West. Upon their arrival in Israel, my grandparents did not speak Hebrew and never learned it. My parents, while becoming fluent in Hebrew, spoke with a heavy Iraqi accent. On their first days, as construction workers, my father and his friends, his, all, of, all of them spoke Arabic, were disdainfully commanded by their Euro-Israeli boss, stop speaking Arabic, we're not in an Arabic country. Arabic, needless to say, was the language of the enemy. A Jew could not speak it, and a Jew could certainly not claim it as an identity marker. In Iraq, my parents often lamented, we were Jews. In Israel, we're Arabs. At home, as children, we became lingui the linguistic police, the secret agents of your Israeli hegemony. We came home voicing what was expected of us, stop speaking Arabic. When my grandparents took the bus with us, we expected them to remain silent. We virtually ordered our parents to forget that alien linguistic baggage of Iraqiness. The target for a colonization of the mind we were the children who were expected to forget the transplanted Baghdads, Kairos, or Casablancas of our homes. Our bodies, language, and thought were regulated to a disciplining, corrective, normalizing machine. My first public performance of the Hebrew language was not a textbook example of the normal linguistic development of a child. I vividly remember my first anxious, anxious days in kindergarten when I was less terrified about the separation from my mother than about what Arabic words would slip into my Hebrew. Although no one had explicitly warned me, something in the social atmosphere made it clear even to a child that Arabic was a taboo language. And soon I learned to master Hebrew in the socially correct form that is minus the Iraqi accent. Unlike my father and my mother, I was becoming free from the traces of the Iraqi shackles of my tongue. I was well on my way to assimilating, relegating the Iraqi accent in Hebrew as well as my Baghdadi Arabic dialect and culture to the private space of home and family. There we could not be observed, watched, gazed upon with scorn or silenced. Although we were on the margins of Sabra Yur Israeli culture, as a child I felt I had a central role in the space of my own family. I acquired the role of a translator, a mediator for my grandparents who could not speak or read Hebrew in, uh, and read the signs in the street. Take care, they could not take care of bills or even converse with non-Arabic speakers in the town. As a child, Hebrew gave me a sense of immense power over the adults in my community. My grandfather depended on me to navigate the unfamiliar currents of Israeli society. And yet, I soon learned to be ashamed of that role. Not for the sake of my grandfather, but because my ability to translate was a mark of the Arab side of my identity. And I just wanted to be transparent without that dark, opaque Arab history unburdened by Arabic culture. 
I soon learned to pretend not to speak Arabic and to speak a Europeanized Hebrew. Standing in front of the mirror, I tried to put some order in the babble of consonants and vowels. I learned to push all the sounds to the front of the mouth as, as though there was a clear border dividing the deep throat where the guttural sound of ka, ta, ha, ah were made. I was very good, an excellent self-colonized student. Gradually, the sounds became began crossing the interior cave of my throat and moved to the opening of the tunnel, liberated from the chains of Arabic consonants. Triumphant in the ease with which all the deep sounds became light, as though I was speaking French and shifted into airy sounds of ka, ta, ha, a. After all, we were taught in so many ways at school to aspire to become Euro-Israeli sabras. This is it, I thought to myself. Hebrew is more like French, of which I had caught a first glimpse, not from the French-speaking Moroccans in the neighborhood, but rather from my mother. She routinely and enthusiastically recited in French the same textbook dialogue, Jean, il fait très beau aujourd'hui, the beauty of which still escapes me, unless it had to do perhaps with her memories of her more glamorous childhood days at the Alliance Francaise School in Baghdad, prior to her eventual loss of French in Israel and the US. My bilingualism as a child then did not represent the harmonious coexistence of fluency in two languages. When the authorities entered our neighborhoods and home in their diverse incarnations as teachers, social workers, or police, my grandparents knew that the honor of the visit was hardly a sign of some reward to be bestowed upon my family. The anxiety level rose high, especially when their sons, one of my uncles, uh, either some of uh, my uncles either defected from the army just for a few weeks to take a break, or were trying to avoid serving, serving in the military altogether. Habiba, tali hon, shufi ashka yerdon minna. Habiba, my mother would, my grandmother would call me in the Jewish Iraqi dialect, see what they want from us. My grandmother, Nana Mas'uda, would call me from the backyard, begging me to abandon the hide-and-seek games I was playing with pigeons and chickens behind the fig tree. My dress stained in with mud, I ran to the house only to find myself speaking with a military police woman searching for my young uncle. The us and them was invariably clear to me. I didn't have to, it didn't have to be spelled out. Yet, I wanted to impress the blonde woman at the door whose proudly ironed khaki uniform made her look as though she ju had just stepped out of an ad in an Israeli magazine, only to heroically land in our humble quarters. But why is Nana so worried, I wondered. Nana was far more breathless than I was after running all the way from the end of the backyard to the front door. Nana, who was always so slow, so lackadaisical, went through a metamorphosis, suddenly speaking fast, almost running in circles around herself like a headless chicken. Why does Nana want me to tell the khaki woman? What does, why does Nana want me to tell the khaki woman that she doesn't know where my uncle is? I know where he is. And soon, I uttered the Hebrew words I thought showed respect for Nana's education and hospitality. He is at Haskell's store. He left this morning, I said, with the confidence of an insider. That will make Nana calmer, I thought, as I receive the warmest, shiniest smile I'd ever received from any cocky woman who quickly turned away toward the central bus station, reinvigorated by my urban topographical insights. My, my speech act of hospitality was rejected by my tearful grandmother, who now froze in her spot at the entrance until my older uncle Naji came. Before he said anything, I found myself running for my life far ahead of the bottle of milk that followed in my wake and was smashed to smithereens of glass floating in a white puddle. I quickly reached the backyard, frightening all the chickens and pigeons in my path and climbing to my spot in the fig tree, which proved not to be the haven that I had imagined it to be. The burning memory taught me a clear lesson about the subtle but strategic difference between a translator and a trader. My fluency in Hebrew and Arabic was experienced quite vis viscerally as a negative dialectic except when my defenses broke down and when on happy, on happy and sad occasions, I suddenly forgot 
that I was supposed to forget Arabic. But actually, at home, um, actually, my home was not easily seduced by the linguistic cultural assimilation. Arabic was the language in which all the emotions around me were expressed. It was the language of the music I heard, the songs we danced to, the conversation at the synagogue, at the Babylonian synagogue, the language in which my father washed my tears with the by now calloused hands of a man who had never known physical labor until he arrived in Israel, the language in which my mother got good deals in the souk, in the marketplace in Petah Tikva, a market almost exclusively inhabited by Iraqi vendors, the language in which my parents heard news from Arabic-speaking radio and TV, the language in which virtually everybody would tune to Um Kulthum, monthly song from Egypt, the language in which we watched hilarious Arabic comedies, Abu Awa, the language in which my grandmother would place her head, would place my head on her lap and sing me an Iraqi lullaby, Oh, Dililol, Dililol, Ya Binti Dililol, Wa'aduki Bilchol. Arabic was the language of the thousand and one night stories our grandfather told us. Kan ya makan al Allah ut klan. And this was he would repeat as a prelude to every story he would tell, no matter what the story was. We would also eat at the very same time the Iraqi pita he, he baked in his own hands in his machbas. It was the language we, he tuned on on the, the language in, he tuned into on the big red, brown radio, he was always reluctant to part with. And even for meals or even during war times, when piercing alarms met everyone run to the shelter. And when transistors were introduced in our lives in the early 70s, he was greatly cheered by the invention. For now, he could be liberated from the confinement of the house and walk freely, his head glued to the black transistor hiding his big ear, his eyes staring at the invisible space as he continued his routine of handing us mlabbis, pastel colored candies with almond inside. And ironically, the name of the town, the Palestinian town where we ended up in. Arabic was the language of the stories my mother told me at every lunch, often repeating the same magical story I knew by heart. The pomegranate that yodeled and the apples that applauded. Sounds without which I refused to chew on my mother's tasteless bamya, okra. It was the language my mother spoke with the Palestinian Amr, who carried a sack full of, a sack full of oranges to sell in our town. A man whose age I couldn't tell, whose gentle smile under his mustache seemed a perfect match to my mother's shyness, both happy for a lunch break from the harsh routines, talked about their lives. My mother, when her virtuoso shape-shifting Arabic dialect began her voyage into his Palestinian dialect, found in him a perfect listener for her nostalgia for Baghdad, and he found in her a patient audience for his memories of a time before his village, Mlabbes, was disappeared by Israel. Arabic and Hebrew, then, were far from being neutral languages. To know Hebrew meant to be Hebrew, which by implication meant the erasure of anything Arabic. Thinking back to these years, it is no wonder that at a fairly young age, English became a language I fancied, fancied intensely. English also brought some affectionate childhood memories. My father was schooled in Baghdad in Shamash school, where English was an important language. The school granted its matriculation according to the British educational system. While the Iraqiness of my father was in the lexicon of my school a sign of backwardness, his knowledge of English carried across borders from Iraq promoted him to the status of a kind of a village scribe in English. Suddenly, our Iraqi history came to our rescue, a social advantage brought from no other place than Baghdad, English, which was brought from Baghdad. 
I often think that English in this situation was a kind of a free zone that did not involve that painful childhood conflict of Hebrew and Arabic. Yet English, obviously, was also not a neutral space. The US post-World War II rise to global power, the 70s Americanization of Israel, British colonial history in Iraq and Palestine, Palestine, all contributed to the English language infiltration of my young mind, unsettling the presence of both Hebrew and Arabic. Year la years later, as I began reflecting on this history in English, I remember inverting the traditional biblical verse, taken up again in the Jimmy Cliff reggae song, and instead of weeping by the waters of Babylon, it was by the water of Zion where we lay down and wept when we remembered Babylon. I've been interested in asking whether memory can exist apart from the desire to memorialize. Can we imagine alternative narratives to the official histories? Perhaps my reflections on our displacement are no more than a monument to my parents and grandparents who have lived in between hostile zones. A fragmented testimony, not simply to the sheer facts, but to the intricacies of emotions. My words speak for a generation muted by the everyday burden of hyphenated realities, their dreams mutilated. Making the silences speak become for me an act of memorializing, a portable shrine for those taboo memories, a reluctant eulogy, lest they completely fade away. Thank you.